it's really an honour to be here. I, I come in and I just have all these memories, but the one that particularly stands out is um, me and my sister used to push wax crayons into the radiator at the back when we were little tiny and we watched the wax drip down because they were so hot and it, oh, it was so much joy but I've seen you've changed the radiators so uh, that's probably a relief rather than having a multicolored one at the back and also running around the whole building after services and uh, John's amazing playing on the piano always stands out um, to me so it's an honor to be here and thank you um, for having me dad <laughs> Um, so this morning I want to um, share with you um, from John chapter 4, and this is the story of Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. So we're just going to start straight in at verse 4. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it wasn't Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, and he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back to draw water. He says, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said, you're right when you, I mean, it's a good job. You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus cried, believe me, Jesus replied, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they're the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and the worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us then Jesus said I the one speaking to you am he just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman but no one said what do you want or why are you talking with her then leaving her water jar the woman came back to town and said to the people come see a man who told me everything I did could this be the Messiah they came out of town and made their way towards him Verse 39, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything that I did. Let's just pray for a minute. God, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're here with us today. Thank you that you're ministering to us in our lives. And God, I thank you that you've brought us all into this room today to hear from your word. We honor you. You are the King of kings and you're the Lord of lords. And we put you first this morning. Would you open our eyes to see who you are and open our hearts? And God, we allow your spirit to move in our lives. And God, would you keep us awake for everyone that was praying through the night in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the woman at the well, when I read this passage, I, like, I, I just think there's so much we can draw out of it. But this is a woman who's defined by her circumstances. And we all have things that we define ourselves by, we kind of, we, we could call them labels, you know, you've heard that I'm daughter of Pastor Andrew, and I'm, um, I'm married, so I'm a wife, and I've got three boys, two have been with me this morning, and I wish 
that they were at home with my husband. They're great. They're really, they are great. But, you know, you know, it's easier to concentrate now that they're uh, singing somewhere else. So I'm mom, mommy, mom if my sons are deciding to be cool or whatever. And, you know, we are defined by lots of things. Uh, my role at work is in, I'm an education and events coordinator at L'Oreal. And um, everyone says, because you're... I oh, know. You didn't need to tell me, guys. Just kidding, just kidding. I don't work for that brand. Anyway, right. Go off track really easily. So I just think, I was thinking about how we, when we go to weddings and we share like these positive things about our lives. You know when you do the small talk, you sat at a table with people you don't know and you're like, you tell them all the best things about who you are, don't you? And I mean, once I definitely got too attached to someone and I, this is a lesson that I've learned. I got too attached to this girl. We were like, I thought we were bonding. I'm looking at Faye because I feel like this, I don't know why, but I feel like this might happen to you as well. <laughs> you were really good at making friends, you know, and I was like making this friend with this girl. Anyway, then the bride comes round and she says, um, how are you getting on? And I was like, yeah, just made my new, met my new best friend. And then after that, the girl just went. <laughs> she, she didn't stay anywhere near me. She didn't come near me. And I thought I, was, I gave her the label of best friend far too quickly. <laughs> You've got to earn that right. Okay, I've learned a lesson. But we share this highlight reel when we meet people that we don't know. And I'm here after many years of, of being away and, and sort of tell you the best bits about my life. And we have these labels, but we also know that not everything that we define ourselves by is a positive thing. And, you know, whether we're at work or at church or, like, at my job, we often do um, personality typing. Anyone done a personality sort of test? Yeah. Um, at work, we did colours. What colour are you? I'm a yellow. When you know, it makes loads of sense. But, you know, at work, everyone's like, oh, they're, very, they're being very blue today. Or they're being very green. <laughs> Who knows? But we're sort of defining each other by these amazing, wonderful rainbow colours. And then, and then, you know, you can do these Enneagrams. Anyone done an Enneagram? I didn't do it. Did you do it, Dad? No. And, uh, and Myers-Briggs. There's loads of different. Or what about on Facebook? Anyone done this one? What kind of biscuit are you? What kind of biscuit are you? Anyone <laughs> Anyone resonate with a rich tea? Like me. Apparently, I am a rich tea. Crunchy and reliable and well suited to every occasion. So if you want to put me in a box, I'm a rich tea, well suited to every occasion. <laughs> but we can allow circumstances in our lives to become like landmarks, you know, and moments that kind of shape who we are and, and we allow them to define how we respond to things. Sorry, I pressed the button. I'll turn it around. <laughs> you know, maybe you've had a promotion and that becomes like a landmark moment. Maybe you've had a pay rise or maybe you got married. But maybe you lost your job. Or maybe you've been through some, some relationship issues or maybe you've made some decisions and you found yourself wondering what is going on. <laughs> Whatever you define yourself by, the truth is, and I want you to know this today, that an encounter with Jesus can change your life and redefine your life completely. And you'll experience that the presence of God will never disappoint. For me, I was in an accident when I was 18 and I got hit by a car. Some of you might remember that, praying for me probably. And, um, and that became like a landmark moment that even now I, I see it as a, as a sort of pivotal point in my life where I experienced the work of God, you know, the healing. But after that, I struggled with my mental health. And I was told I had post-traumatic stress disorder. I had general anxiety disorder. And I was given these labels and, and roles and titles and, and things like that. And maybe weren't exactly how I would like to define myself. But I would have always said I was a worrier. I also said I was a perfectionist, which if you want, this is a freebie in a job interview. You know when they say, what's your strength? You can say, I'm a perfectionist. I work really hard at achieving. I want everything to be just as it should be. And they say, and what's your weakness? I'm a perfectionist. And it means that sometimes I get really frustrated when things just don't go right to plan. So you can have that one as a freebie if you're not sure. Strengths and weaknesses, perfection, ticket in both boxes. And um, 
but you know, perfectionism isn't actually a helpful thing. It's about control. But I, like the woman at the well, has found that an encounter with Jesus can change and redefine your life. And the presence of God never disappoints. Things in your life can change in a second. I feel like the prophet Ronan Keating sang that life is a roller coaster. You've just got to ride it. I'll try not to sing. Do you know there's a really massive part of me that wants to keep singing, but I won't. The reality is, life is a roller coaster. Things do change. Things are changeable. Things are not reliable. And but God is faithful, and He will never leave you, never forsake you. He'll never let you down. And um, and that is what we can hinge our lives on. You know, we look at this woman that's come into the well. And we don't know her background, her upbringing. We don't know how she would define herself in a biscuit. I would say she's not a rich tea. I'm now trying to think what kind of biscuit she would be. If I, if she's one of them that when you dip, it breaks off and falls, you know, she, it falls to the bottom and then you, the sludge at the bottom. I mean, that's really not a nice way to define anybody, is it? The sludge at the bottom of your tea. When you, if you ever live in London and they've got lime scale, you can never drink the bottom of your tea. Just a note to self. If you're a student in the room thinking of going to London, you can't drink the bottom of the tea. But, um, you know, like, she, we don't know how she's defining herself, but we do know that she's struggling to hold down healthy relationships. We can see that really easily. She's part of a community where people probably knew her stuff. You know, people will have known her from being a woman that's had relationships with many men. And she's down and out, and her existence is, is kind of a bit depressing and a, and a bit broken. And I wonder what she's tried in her life to get out of the rut that she's been in. What she turned to to try and sort of find a way out. And when I picture the woman at the well, I actually picture a woman that I know that lives near me. She's called Grace. And the reason I think of Grace is because everyone knows Grace on our street. And maybe you can think of someone in your street <laughs> or in your neighborhood that's a bit like Grace. Everyone knows everything that, is, that Grace is going through. And, you know, I can walk down the street and Grace will be on the other side of the road and she says, You're all right. All right, I live in Salford, guys, okay. I'll say Manchester most of the time, but right now, I'll admit, it's Salford. And, and she goes, you're right? And I'm like, yeah, you? And she goes, no. No, I'm not all right. And then she comes over and she starts to tell me, he's done this and he's done that. And, she, you know, she wears everything out there. And, um, and poor Grace, because she's never seems to be in a good place, you know? And when we read this passage, the woman, she's going to this regular place to get the water. It's a regular drinking hole, right? It's called Sikar. Now, Sikar actually means drunken, deeply drunk, confusion, falsehood, deceit, deception, disappointment, foolish, ungodly, idolatry. I don't know if that's a good place to go and get a drink. And as the woman comes to the story, um, it, the woman in the story comes to the well in that moment that would have been very mundane to her. This would have been like an everyday scenario. She goes to the well to get her water. She suddenly has this encounter with Jesus that reshapes and redefines everything that she knew as her, her life had been. And you know, that's my prayer for my neighbor. I ended up actually praying with her on the street the other day because, you know, I've said everything that needs to be said. And so I'll just, right, let's pray. But we find this beautiful moment. And what I love about this is that Jesus just begins a conversation. He doesn't expose the woman or cast judgment. He just says, go and get your husband. Yeah, he already knows what, what is going on in her life. But he's like opening a con He's like giving her an opportunity to share. He's not trying to hang her out to dry or expose her. She's the very meaning of Sikha, right? She is confused. She's living in this idolatrous place. There's probably lots of things before God. And living in deception, living in self-doubt. You know, she's sort of telling herself, this is, this is my lot in life. And maybe some of you today are there thinking, this is my lot in life. This is just how I've always been. Or, you know, some people you're like, oh, they always land on their feet. There's always one person you're like, they always get them. All right, I had a friend always ended up backstage at these mega gigs. I'm like, how did he manage that? Always seemed to land on his feet in every job. And you know, there's always someone, but then there's always someone that is the complete opposite of that, like our grace, you know? And it just seems like nothing can go right in her life. But Jesus offers her living water. 
living water that can change her eternal destiny, that can like quench that thirst that she has, that emptiness, that feeling of emptiness in her life. And she says these words, I can see that you are a prophet, which reminds me of that Uh, of the hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. There's something about Jesus. When you see him for who he is, she's not judged by her mistakes and shown, she's shown love and grace. And we know that Jesus is stepping over all these cultural barriers, you know. He's, he's, a, Samari uh, he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan, so that, that kind of crossover doesn't really happen. There's a, he's crossing a gender line by being a bloke, speaking to a woman. And, and even though he's tired and he's hungry, which we all know that when guys are tired and hungry and hangry, you know, can we get much sense? But no, but Jesus is tired and hungry, but nothing stops him from minutes. Sorry, guys. Sorry, I was harsh. It happens to me too. I get tired and hungry and hangry. But, but in this moment, Jesus is waiting on food. The disciples, they've gone to get food. And, and nothing gets in the way of him taking this opportunity to minister to this woman who needs to be shown love in her life. We might understand, um, you know, a little bit, maybe you can think of someone like Grace in your life, or we might know a woman like the woman in the story, but the reality is we also all understand what it's like to feel disappointment, to feel insecurity, confusion. We have all made mistakes, unless you're perfect, like my dad. <laughs> He's not, it's fine. You know, we've all made mistakes. We all understand what it's like to feel those feelings of disappointment, confusion. And what is amazing is there is nothing you can do that will stop Jesus crossing the lines to meet with you, that will stop God from loving you. Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Romans 8, 39. There is nothing you can do that will make God love you any less, whether you're in the room today or you're watching online. There is nothing, there is no distance that you can kind of create between you and God that he won't stretch over to meet with you. That, he, that kind of will stop him from showing you love and compassion. The woman at the well allows Jesus to define who she was rather than everything that had gone before. And on having this redefining moment with Jesus, she leaves a jar behind in verse 28 and she goes to tell others about Jesus. She leaves her old way of living. She's no longer defined by difficult relationships, but she's now a person who's trusted by others because of the evidence of Jesus' um, transformation that's happened in her life. When we look at Jesus and see him for who he really is, we understand that the presence of God is never a place of disappointment, but a place of redemption, a place of acceptance, a place of love. And Jesus offers living water that will truly satisfy. Everything that's gone before, everything that was defining us before we encounter Jesus doesn't have to impact our future. Often we think, well, this happened, so I'll always be that way. This happened, so that's going to happen. Or maybe you think something happened in my parents' life, and I'm going to live with the consequences of that, and I live under the weight of that. But actually, an encounter with Jesus, it says in the Bible, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And when we have an encounter with Jesus, he's starting a conversation which can change our lives. Many of us today have already had an encounter with Jesus. And we say, the old has gone and the new has come. I remember singing in this room, I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. Someone's singing it. Here in the grace of God I stand. <laughs> you all left me hanging. So I want you to think back to the moment, maybe if you've had an encounter with Jesus, where your life was changed. I remember becoming a Christian when I was seven at a kids' camp, and I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, you do think, actually, 
your life is changed. And I always think for the moments when you make decisions that kind of aren't in line, you know deep down that they're, they're not in line with maybe what God's called you to because you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you have this sense of spiritual discernment. So when you have an encounter with Jesus, you suddenly opened up to so much more in, in your life. You can see so much more. I can see now that Jesus is who we need to follow. But we've had these encounters with Jesus. And I want everyone around me to encounter Jesus, just like I've had that moment. I want their lives to be changed for the better. And, and what's amazing about this woman is that after she's had this amazing encounter, she goes and shares her testimony. And people are like, wow, you're so different. They see something different in her from seeing her as someone that was down and out, that was always like the, the biscuit sludge at the bottom did not know, this was not in my notes about the biscuit sludge. But you know, she's been seen as this, but now there's something changed. There's like a light gone on in her eyes. And, and you know, when the Bible talks about Jesus is the light of the world, that's what we're seeing. People begin to see this change. And I want for you today, if you've got Jesus in your life, you know who Jesus is and you see him, then I want you to know that you can share the love of Jesus with other people around you, just like this woman in this story. I know that I can bring God's love to those around me. You know, I prayed for grace on the street because there's no more words. We need to start bringing people to Jesus. Um, I can invite my builders. We've got an extension going on and I can invite my builders to church and I've given them the flyer for Christmas. This is a great time to share about church and inviting people to it, into this space. You know, you can offer prayer I've, I've prayed with my nail girl. I got my nails done once and this woman, she's sharing about her stuff in her life and I'm like, hey, can I pray with you? And you know, it's not as scary as it sounds. You, she could have said no and then I'd have gone, okay, cool. And then I could either maybe never go back <laughs> or I could keep going back, do you know what, and keep offering. But in the moment I said to her, can I pray with you? And she went, yes, please, I would love to pray with you. I've not prayed for years. And what an opportunity. I get a lot of Ubers for work, and it sounds fancy. Sometimes when we get Ubers in London, I, drive, I wind the window down, and I'm like, imagine I'm a fancy person. <laughs> I don't think you could be fancy from, <laughs> no, joking, but um, from Salford. But, you know, I get a lot of Ubers, and I think this is an opportunity to share the love of God. I've got this guy in the car, well, he's got me in the car, for five minutes or ten minutes, and, and let's start a conversation. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to kind of try and expose someone for their sins. I'm not going to say, turn or burn. But I'm going to say, hey, have, like, what's your journey? You know, like Jesus says to the woman, Where, where's your husband? You know, he knows about her life. But he's like, let's start a conversation. I invited my Uber driver to church and he turned up and gave his life to Jesus. So, yeah, hallelujah. But who is that in your life that you could be sharing with this week? And so for some of us today, God wants to remind you to be a light in the darkness, to bring hope to the hopeless and Christmas is a great time for that. And for others, I believe that we need to look at where we're filling our buckets from. Like the woman at Sikar. You know, she's come into this place of confusion, idolatry, and deception. Are you filling up your well from a place called wealth? Popularity? All these Gen Zers want to be insta, insta famous and all of this. But is that a healthy place to be filling up their, their jars from? Are you filling up your well? in bad habits or, or habits and behavior that kind of come in, in front of your, your time with God and, and maybe your time that you spend with God? Or maybe there's a bad habit that's kind of what you do in your life that actually isn't what God would say over you. Maybe you're someone that's quick to anger, like me. <laughs> or are you coming to Jesus for living water? If what you're defined by is the, what the world is dictating you to have or to be, you are your bank balance, you're your job role, you're your health, you're just a mom, you're just a housewife, you're just a dad, you're just a, a, a guy, you're just whatever, I want you to be reminded that the presence of God never disappoints. You are a child of God. 
When God knit me together in my mother's womb, he didn't choose a life of worry for me. He didn't choose panic attacks or fear where I'd said I was born a warrior. It's part of my DNA. That wasn't what God wanted for my life. No, God said that I am more than a conqueror with Christ who gives me strength, Romans 8, 37. That with God, I can experience beyond what I could ever ask or imagine, Ephesians 3.20. God is our helper. It says, I look to the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, Psalm 121. The joy of the Lord is my strength, Nehemiah 8 and Joshua 1 verse 9. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Jesus didn't look at the woman at the well with judgment. He looked at her with care and love. And I want you to know that Jesus is looking at you with care and love. No matter how far you might feel from what you know God is calling you to, Jesus is always waiting to talk to you, gently opening up a conversation. He's allowing an opportunity for honesty and redemption. The presence of God will never disappoint. It will help you feel peace in times of trouble. It's not just a cliche, it's true. He'll bring calm in your storm. He can help you to be free from worry. He can help you to be free from perfectionism. You know, you can still use it in your interview. But but do you know what? I want to give control to God because he's the author, he's the perfecter of my faith. He knows what he's planned out for my life and it's all good and he can see what's in my future. He knows how we're going to navigate through different difficult situations. You know, I am going to define myself as a child of God over all the other things because that is where we can find our security. He is the rock and when you think you're hitting rock bottom, you hit the rock at the bottom and today, God is going to speak to us about dealing with some of the things that maybe we need to deal with in our lives. Today, you're at the right place and the right time for an encounter with Jesus. We're going to spend some time reflecting and coming into God's presence. In James chapter 4, verse 8, he says, As you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. So we're going to ask a few questions and we'll just spend a time, a bit of time in reflection and you guys can come up if you want. And um, why don't we just close our eyes for a minute, if you're comfortable. Oh, they can come up. Oh, don't come up. I wonder what is the conversation that God wants to start with you today? You might think that everything's going well, or you might think that there's some difficulties. What is it that God's drawing into your mind right now? The Holy Spirit is going to speak to you right now. Sometimes everything seems to be going well, and you read the Bible, and then you go, ooh, I read the Bible, and I read this verse about how we are called to peace. And it stood out to me because sometimes I'm not a peace bringer. So I'm asking the Holy Spirit to move in my life so that I can, I can change for the better. For some of you, it'll be leaving something behind. The woman at the well left behind her jar. The thing that she was filling up with every time she's coming out every day filling up again from this place the same place every day the same thing over and over again it's like hitting a brick wall for some people and encounter with Jesus and she leaves the jar she's going to stop filling up from this place where she's feeling confused she's putting things in front of God Or this place of deception where maybe she's just telling herself everything's fine when it's maybe not. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're saying everything's fine and you're trying to even convince yourself. But there's some things that you just need to bring to God. Some of you are thinking that your journey is over. (laughs) 
that actually you kind of hit this point where you're like, oh, do you know what? I'm going to pass on to the next generation. But actually God's saying he's going to reignite a fire in your life today. He's going to renew that sense of passion and for life and zest for sharing God's love with other people around you. But for some people, they're leaving things at the well today putting stuff down his yoke is easy and his burden is light if things are feeling heavy maybe you feel like you're carrying this backpack and it's so heavy God's saying come and just put it down he is the prince of peace and today we're going to allow God to define where you get your value from Philippians 1 verse 6 says, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work will continue it to completion. If you've experienced the fact that the presence of God never disappoints and you know it to be true, who is it in your life that you're sharing it with? Your breakthrough, like the woman at the well, could be the catalyst for someone else's breakthrough. Matthew 5 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp, a light under a lamp. Uh, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. An encounter with Jesus will redefine your life and the presence of God will never disappoint. God, we just want to honour you for the woman at the well who had that encounter with Jesus that when we read the Bible today, we can understand different aspects of who we are and, and who you are to us, Lord God. And we want to put our trust in you right now. We bring all the things that maybe are coming up that the Holy Spirit is drawing to the surface and we want to put them in your hands. We trust you with the family members who are struggling around us. We trust you with the circumstances that we're facing that we can't see a way through. God, we trust you. Like a refiner's fire, refining to the surface, God's bringing up the gold in your life. God, would you help us to define ourselves as children of God and not with anything else that this world offers us. We trust you, God, and we thank you. And God, would you just bring someone into our lives that we're able to share your light with in Jesus' name.